But yeah, so like there was one runner that was missing for like 11 hours, another guy was missing for 24 hours. Hello and welcome back to the Free Outside Podcast where we talk to cool people, talk about cool topics, and build a cool community. We have an announcement today. I, along with Allison Powell, are putting on a race in Bozeman, Montana. We're calling it the Montana Meltdown. There's a four hour, a 12 hour, and a 24 hour in beautiful Bozeman, Montana, October 12th to the 13th. Link down below, sign up, come party with, with us in the Rocky Mountains. With that, today's guest on the show is, I would say a 200 mile expert. She has won many 200 milers, raced many 200 milers, and just done a ton of other cool races as well. She has really cool stories going back to the first year of Bigfoot, which is insane. We get into that. It's a fun conversation. We have Mika Hughes on the podcast today, and let's just dive into the episode. So sign up for that race too. Thank you guys for being here. Let's go. All right. Thanks for joining the podcast, Mika. So first off, I'm going to try a new opening question here. When you were a little kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Huh? Well, probably, uh, probably like a singer, something like that. I, I didn't really think about it too hard. I think I just picked like the one that sounded like everyone else wanted to do. I, uh, yes, I don't think I, uh, seriously considered the question. I still don't think I've seriously considered the question. Yeah, are you a but singer now? Can you sing? I am completely tone deaf, and no one would enjoy hearing me sing. I can oh, I wasn't do that. Wasn't gonna make you. I was just curious if uh, that that dream came to fruition at all. I I do sometimes get embarrassed uh, during races. Especially like at night, if I'm singing out loud to myself, and then like all of a sudden I see a person, uh, and I do sometimes feel the need to apologize for them hearing my singing out loud. But I mean, how loud can you really be singing while you're running? Probably, probably yeah. not that but, well. I mean, it's, it's bad, probably, but it's probably not that loud. True. Yeah, it's probably a good way to stay awake, though. I, I mean, I usually talk to myself in like accents or like impressions or something really stupid sounding. Are you, is singing your method to stay awake when you're alone out there? <laughs> Usually, well, when I'm feeling good, when I'm feeling bad, I'm just, you know, being like throwing my own pretty party in my head. But when I'm feeling good, I'll definitely uh, sing out loud. Yeah. I think but. we met during one of those, we both were probably having a pity party the first year of Kokodota, somewhere right before the Mount Eldon <laughs> climb. I think we met. Yeah, well, you were in a good mood because you were chatting with your pacer, whoever was with you. I was out of my mind and uh, did not really register when you passed me. But yeah, did we meet at that? Was that when we met on that first year of Cocodona, I think? Yes, for Very sure. Very late. No, I remember up, exactly when you... Well, like I, I remember when you passed me, but like I wasn't functional enough to even say hi. Yeah. I think Joel was like, Joel was like, oh, that was, I think Joel might have even had been paying attention to where people were because he was like, oh, that's the true hiker. I don't even know. He definitely mentioned you, <laughs> but I don't, I don't remember very much of that climb. Oh, yeah. I don't remember hardly any of that whole race. It was like my second ultra marathon. I didn't know how anything worked. It was a very, very tough year, too. Did you get third that first year of Cocodona? No, no. I got fourth. Oh, sad. Somehow. I, I was completely out of it. I uh, can't believe I pulled that off because it was like 90-something hours. Like, it was not good. Um, that whole race was a mess. I mean, I was a mess at that race, and then they had a lot of little kinks to work out that first year, I think. But, uh, yeah, that was a rough one. 
That and the stupid power line switchback climb out of like what was it, Blackpool or something? That was the worst. Yeah, one of those places. I think I just laid down and slept for like 10 minutes there, just in a heap. Well, so my thing, I was so exhausted and tired. So I would I would hike up, like, if I made it up, like, one and a half switchbacks, I let myself lay down for three minutes. <laughs> and then I would get up and do one and a half switchbacks and then lay down for three minutes. And I just did that over and over until I finally got to the top. Oh, my gosh. Would you sleep for those three minutes or just, like, lay there? I, I mean, I have no idea. I was out of my mind. I was out of my mind for most of that race. I mean, my sleeping was so bad. Like, I slept, I think that's maybe the 200 miler that I slept the most at. Like, I must have slept seven hours during that race. At least eight hours, like, split up. <laughs> uh, Is that the yeah, longest definitely. you've ever been out during a race or the longest any event's ever taken? <sighs> Either the first year Cocodona or Moab the year I did it. I don't, I don't know which one was longer because I think, and my first year at Bigfoot was pretty long, but not, I think, because I was over four days for both Cocodona and Moab. I think those are the two longest. I don't, I don't remember which one's longer. They were both awful though. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to the beginning. How did you get into ultras or running in general? Um, well, so my mom's a runner, so, like, growing up, she used to make us do, like, little races, like, locally, uh, and they were terrible, and I hated running, and (laughs) then once I went to college, I, uh, everyone was just, everyone was in shape, and I was very out of shape, and, uh, so after the first year of college, I just decided I wanted to, you know, get into shape. I was overweight at that point and uh lose some weight and picked up running and so i started running in like june of 2010 and then in october september october i did my first half marathon and then in that may i did my first marathon wow and uh then i got into a accident and i had to take some time off that summer but then I got back into it and did another marathon in the next fall. And then when did you jump and, to uh, trails and beyond marathons? Yeah, so when I was in college, at one point I decided I must have been must have been about 20. I was like, well, I was going to school on the East Coast. And I'm like, well, I can try and get fast and qualify for Boston. Or I can just keep running slow and double the distance. And so, yeah, in 2012, I did my first 50. And so I just decided to double the distance. I think I had run like eight miles of trails before I did a 50-mile trail race, <laughs> like in total in my life. Um, wow. So I fell like four times the first 25 miles. Uh, it was a steep learning curve with that. And then, uh, but after that, I was pretty hooked. And uh, I did 100 the next, the year after in 2013, did my first 100. And then two years later, I did my first 200 in 2015. So kind of all. Did you just like uh, going up in distance? It's all amped up pretty quickly. I kind of just kept just deciding to double it. Was the draw to just get further and further and see how far you could do it? Or did you just like the challenge? Or why did you keep going up rather than see how fast you could do 100 or something like that? I just, I don't think I like to run fast. Like, I was like, I don't want to do speed work. I don't want to, like, try and run really fast. Like, that sounds terrible. I'd rather just, you know. And then once you get to 200s, like, after a while, it's like, oh, like, you can be kind of fast at 200s, but, like, you don't have to be actually fast. And, like, you can still do pretty well. And once I realized that, I was like, I mean, no one was running them. But, uh. Yeah, I don't know. I just, like, after, I just kind of stumbled upon, I heard about Tahoe, I guess, must have been after the first year in 2014, and uh, then I saw they were coming out with Bigfoot, and I was like, oh, I didn't even know 200s existed, and, I mean, no one did back then. They were brand new, Um, and looking between Tahoe and Bigfoot, I'm like, well, I live in the Midwest, so 
it'd be better to do less elevation, like a lower high point in the race. So I decided not to do Tahoe and do Bigfoot, which of course is like close to 50,000 feet of climbing. But I was like, but it only goes up to 6,000 feet. So I won't get like altitude sickness. Yeah. Uh, totally. It was great. Yeah. I want to hear more, was... more about the first year of Bigfoot because it sounds crazy. It was insane. It was the crazy, like, I could talk about that all day. I mean, like, spot trackers were optional, so a bunch of people weren't wearing them. Um, people got food poisoning at the aid stations. Uh, one person even had to drop because the food poisoning was so bad, but we all got food poisoning because, like, no one knew anything about food safety back then. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> racist. Um... But yeah, so like there was one runner that was missing for like 11 hours. Another guy was missing for 24 hours and <laughs> made it back down to the road into the towards the high school, but was coming from the wrong direction. So we have no idea like where he went. He was over 200 miles and he finished before the cutoff. I mean, he didn't do the course, but I mean, it was the first year. So no one was cared too much about all that, but. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, there were a lot of shenanigans. Like, we were allowed to camp out at the school that first year. So mm -hmm. everyone was, like, just pitched tents in the, like, next to the parking lot. And, uh, you know, there was beer miles, backwards beer miles, and <laughs> all kinds of stuff that went on. Like, the night before the race, before we had to wake up at, like, 6 a or 5 a.m. to, like, load the buses. So was it not even really even a race? It was almost like a get together and a march through the woods of like the, all these brave people. <laughs> it had a lot more of that vibe. I mean, I don't know if like the fast people that did end up podium were competitive, but like most of us were just like, we had no idea what we were doing. Like two, like there had been one, one year of Tahoe had happened mm -hmm. and that was the only 200 mile mountain race in the country. I think at that point. So there had been, like, one 200 that happened before Bigfoot happened. And, like, none of us knew the course, really. And it was brutal. And, every like, everyone had terrible blisters. Like, my feet were completely destroyed. Like, no one knew about pre-taping. Well, a couple people did, but, yeah. A Colorado 200 used to exist, and that happened, actually, too. So there had been two 200s that had happened that year, or that before. But, uh... Yeah, it was uh, a gnarly, gnarly time. I mean, yeah, it it had much more of a, like, we're all in this together kind of a feel. Yeah. I'm like, let's all just help each other survive this walk through the woods kind of vibe than, than the races do now. But Did, uh, did you yeah. enjoy that it was so brutal? Was it fun for you? Is that why you enjoy 200s in general? Oh, it was, it was awful. It was like, I was miserable the entire four days. Like I was absolutely not happy for like four days straight. And I was not happy at the finish. Like I wasn't smiling. I didn't care that I had finished. I just wanted to shower and like sit down. And uh, it wasn't until like a week later that I was like, huh, that was probably like the best thing I've ever done in my life. Wow. And then, and, uh, so then you were hooked. Yeah, and I mean, I I was the youngest runner that year. I was 24 when I did it, so, yeah. So, I mean, everyone looked at me as, like, I mean, now there are, like, 18-year-olds doing them, right? Mm -hmm. But back then, like, 24, everyone was like, what are, why did you sign up for this? What's your background? I'm like, oh, I've done, like, 200-miler races in the Midwest, so I figured I could come and do this in Washington State. <laughs> and, uh Yeah. It was uh, not great, but I got made a, met a lot of people, made a lot of friends, and uh, yeah, a lot of friends that I still still have to this day. So yeah, you go back that. to that every year, or at least race it every other year now too. It must be special in some way. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's hard to say which is my favorite. I think Tahoe might be my favorite race, but I do really like Bigfoot and. Yeah, I've missed one year. I wasn't there in 2016, but other than that, I volunteer on the the even years. So, like, this year I'll be eight station captaining, and which is probably my favorite volunteer job to do at a race. But, um, yeah, it's a great, it's a great little, it's 
great little group of people that show up for that. I mean, now there's like a bunch of new people, but when you, you know, so a lot of the old people are around too, still like volunteering and helping out. And even like people from the first couple of years, you know, it's not necessarily just the first year. I mean, there were like 60 of us that year, so it was just so small. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you've done like every 200 in the, well, now there's more every single year. What is like your favorite race you've ever done of all the the distances, the races, even Boston this year? Is anything touched the 200s that are just so remote or are those your favorite? No, I know. I mean, Tahoe's probably, Tahoe's probably my favorite. Like the full loop Tahoe. I mean, nothing okay. can really compare to that. I mean, I love Bigfoot, but like Bigfoot, I need like a year off because like I, I'll race Tahoe every year that I can. Mm-hmm. But Bigfoot, I need like a year off to like forget enough about it to like want to do it again. Because there's just like, it's brutal. It's just, it can be pretty brutal out there. So, but like Tahoe, like you're right along the lake, like some of the aid stations are in ski lodges. You know, you're running like, you go through straight through Incline Village, like there's civilization. Um, so it's not as remote as Bigfoot and it's like a lot easier in some ways, but. I just like the Sierras are just so gorgeous. I just, that area Mm -hmm. is just amazing. Yeah. I mean, you could just like go for an FKT down there and be in the Sierra for multiple days. (laughs) I know. I don't don't know if uh, FKTs are going to be my thing, but there's like one I like maybe want to go after, but not, nothing serious. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to this year how do you turn around from Cocodona and in, in one month and still win tahoe that seems crazy for yeah. two 200s within about a month yeah dude that was a that was a rough recovery from Cocodona, as i <laughs> imagine you can relate to i wasn't uh, even was running yet. i wasn't even running yet by the time you were racing tahoe 200 that's how rough my well, recovery the funny was. thing is yeah, like the whole podium, right? So, because uh, Harry was first and Mike McKnight was second, mm-hmm. and all three of us had raced Pocadona. Yeah. So. Yeah, I guess you I, don't need any uh, recovery or taper or anything. You just jump from one to the next. Yeah, I mean, I felt absolutely terrible for the first three weeks after Pocadona. Mm-hmm. I was like struggling to like, do any running. And then I did a track workout uh, just because I was visiting home and everyone was doing it. So I was like, oh, I'll try to do this track workout. And like halfway through the second sprint, my hamstring just gave out and like it, it like didn't work anymore. And so like for the week, I was in like massive amounts of pain. I could like barely walk. I was like trying to do runs. Um, and uh, I think my body was just telling me to stop. It wasn't until the week before the race. I think I got like one week of training in before Tahoe, and then, yeah, I did. I did like a hundred mile week, and then I had like a four day taper, and then I raced Tahoe. Wow. So. What's your mindset going into a two hundred? Are you like a spreadsheet person? Do you have like paces that you want to go, or do you just go by effort level? How do you attack these? Yeah, so I'm, I don't know if I'm an outlier. I mean, I'm sure I'm an outlier. So I am, as you know, very low tech. I have <laughs> sheets of paper with the uh, aid stations and drop bags listed, and I make guesses on what time I'll be at everything. And then I just have this, like, handwritten sheet of paper that I'll show. If I have, like, crew or pacers, I'll just show that to them and be like, yeah, I think this is probably right I like sort of looked at the course map I kind of know the elevation and it's usually like wildly off (laughs) Um, and then uh, yeah so I've never made a spreadsheet in my life but uh, just kind of and you know once you do races enough right like Bigfoot was probably a lot well so when I raced Bigfoot last year I, you know, I have past years to go off of, so I was able to kind of guess. But, you know, I raced Bigfoot in 2021 and 2023, and my goal was the same both years. I was shooting for 65 hours. 
Yeah. And so in 2021, I ran 76 hours because it was a really hot year. And, like, the course conditions were just, like, there were so many down trees. Like, the course was in really bad shape. And then I had the same goal in 2023, and I ended up 58 hours. So both <laughs> I was, like, off by over eight hours. Wow. Um, so, and, you know, you you don't have, like, the, your crew can't check where you are because there's no service anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, it's being off on your times is not necessarily, it doesn't make it easy if you do have crew. They're not yeah. usually too happy about that. Do you race to a time like that or do you race the field? How would you? I race time. Okay. You don't care what anyone yeah. else does? No. No, and, like, that was the thing with Kokodona. Everyone was, like, like I, I didn't know where the woman behind me was the entire – I think Rachel was – I think Rachel was behind me for most of it. Like, or she was, like, racing, like, first or second. So I had no idea where she was. I didn't know when I passed her. I didn't know how much time I had on her because mm -hmm. I was just trying to hit a time goal. Cause, you know, obviously I was going for sub-70, which – I mean, I was on pace for until obviously I had my little spill, but um, yeah. So I was just like, I had no idea where anyone was that entire. Well, I was trying to catch you too, but other than that, I knew you were right ahead of me. Yeah, we I was were like, like, hi. I wonder if I'll catch you. Yeah, you. I mean, I was just like leaking blood out my nose, and then, but eventually, it's like the blood in a fall that caused you to stop. So it was very strange. I, like when you passed me going into Walnut, I was covered in blood. It looked like I'd murdered. Oh, I remember. Or we weren't sure what happened. It looked like you fell on your face. We were like, "Oh, you had a bad fall," and then we found out it was just a nosebleed. <laughs> yeah. What? So what happened at Cocodona from Walnut to the end? Yeah. So uh, you got out ahead of me at Walnut. Um, so right when I stood up to leave, I puked like eight times. Um, and then just immediately walked out, uh, which was not the right decision because mm. all of the, you know, food I had taken in was then gone. Um, but yeah, I just ended up falling twice in a row. So I, you know, I had been racing with a, I fractured my elbow like 12 days out from the race. So I like couldn't use poles or anything. And, uh, I was just trying to be careful and I had taken a fall earlier in the race, but I didn't hit it really bad. It was just a bit sore. And, you know, my orthopede was just like, you can't fall on your elbow again. <laughs> Do not fall. I was like, well, that I'll try. Um, and so, yeah, when I left Walnut, we were just, it, you know, that first section is flat. And uh, I was with my friend Joel, who was pacing. And, like, we were just talking, and I took a fall, and I, like, hit my elbow on the ground. And so I was super frustrated and, like, obviously it hurt. And I stood up and started going again. And then within a minute or two, I fell a second time. And that that time I had my arms to my side, I think, because I just hit my elbow. And so I hit the ground directly with my chin. Oh. And it, I like, got, my teeth punctured the inside of my mouth. It didn't go all the way through. But I was, like, dripping blood out of my mouth, laying on the ground, <laughs> Like, you know, scratched all over my face. My jaw hurt so bad. And I was just like, you know, Joel like moved my jaw and was like, well, I don't think it's broken. Cause I, you know, you'd be screaming in pain if it was. But I was like, like I couldn't, I couldn't chew. Like I couldn't do anything. I could, I couldn't talk. Like I couldn't really move my jaw much. Um, and it started swelling up pretty bad. And like, then the blood was like dripping down my throat and I had already lost all the food. So it was just making me more and more nauseous. Um, but we hiked another two miles to where that last road before you turn onto the trail to go up Eldon. And as we were walking down that road, I just turned to him and I, I like slowed down a little bit more and a little bit more. And I said, like, I think I'm going into shock. And I pretty much just like immediately sat down and couldn't get back up. Oh, so we sat there for like, I pulled out my busy, got in it, sat there for like, I don't know, half, half an hour. But then he, Joel didn't have his busy. 
So he was in shorts, and he was getting very cold. So he's like, well, we got to make a decision. And I was like, I, I, I don't think I can stand up, let alone go up over Eldon. And so, yeah, then I called, and I thought I had to call my race and DNF. And we just went back to the hotel. Uh, and I told Steve and everything. And then uh, the next morning I woke up feeling like I just – I passed out and I woke up and I ate and then it felt like I, like usually, I guess shock is like a blood pressure thing. So I don't know, maybe my blood pressure started to get back to normal and then I felt silly that I had dropped. So I asked Steve if I could finish. So you, in the middle of a race, you slept for basically three hours and then went, or I mean 10 hours and then went back and finished still on the podium. Yeah, I think yeah, I think I slept for like ten hours. That's so crazy. Just in the middle of twenty miles or so from the end, just a ten hour nap and still end up on the podium. Yeah, well I mean, you know, obviously I was way off my time goal. But, you know, had I not fallen I would have hit it, so but yeah, I mean it is what it is. It was disappointing, but I mean, in the like, like you, I mean, you have what three, six place finishes. I now have two third place finishes in our uh, own. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, wasn't what I was going for. It's good. At, I was happy not to have a DNF. Like I didn't, I didn't think it would cause any controversy, which I, apparently it kind of did. And people like were like, "Oh, did she go to a hospital and get an IV?" And it, <laughs> like, it's just. It's kind of funny, too, because it's like, you know, if you look at the, the rules for, like, doping and stuff, right? Like, it's not just in competition you're not allowed to get IVs. Like, you're not allowed to get IVs at all. Yeah, And exactly. like, So, like, you know, and all the people questioning, and it's like, you know, if you're, like, hung over and go to, like, one of those IV bars and get an IV, like, that's a doping violation. <laughs> and, yep. like... Eh, I mean, I understand everyone's concerned because, like, obviously I'd be concerned about that too. But it's just like, do you guys even even know the rules that you think I'm breaking? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But, yeah, I, I think, well, and you can go to a hotel in the middle of the race. I think it's just, I don't know what the rules exactly are, but it seems pretty firmly within them. That race is so unique that you do go by multiple hotels as well. I know, yeah. Like, a lot of people do sleep in hotels in the middle of the race. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, I've never, well, I had never done it before that. But, yeah, <laughs> people, you're allowed to just uh, leave with your crew as long as you go back and, yeah, um, yeah, and you definitely go to hotels and shower and stuff. That's exactly what you did. It's just usually what people not aiming for the podium do. So it's kind of funny it worked into your race, finally. Yeah, I think I, I think I took some Aleve and uh, ate some ate some pretzels. <laughs> That's pretty much what I did at the hotel. I did shower, so that was then, nice. But and then slept and then just finished it out. Just a twenty mile training run in the morning. <laughs> well, yeah, that was it. Like, cause you know my the two guys that were helping crew me, uh, Joel and Mike, like they had work, so I was like. I'll just be sitting in the hotel feeling sorry for myself. I may as well just see if Steve will let me out on the course to go just do like a morning run. And that was, uh, I think they had video of my finish. And the, as I crossed the finish line, I I think my words were like, see, I, I told you it wouldn't take that long. And that was because uh, as I was driving Joel back, uh, dropping him off, he was like, I was, that's when we started talking about it. And I was like, you know, I bet I could do it in, like, four hours. And Joel's like, well, you know, you're hurt. Like, don't push it too hard. You probably shouldn't do it by yourself. I'm like, no, it'll be fine. It's just like a morning run. I bet I could do it in under four hours. And I finished, and it was, like, like under three and a half hours. And it was, like, right around, I think I did it in about three hours-ish, maybe a little over. <laughs> so it was, like, relative, like, yeah, it was definitely under four hours. And so that's why my words were, I told you it wouldn't take that long. Yeah, that's hilarious. I mean, you were flying down uh, from Eldon. I remember trying to catch you at the finish was pretty hard. If 
Sorry, what was that? Oh, I mean, you were flying down Elden. Even just trying to time it to see you at the finish was pretty tough. It was like, uh, like oh, she's five miles out, can still get some food. And then it's like, no, it's going by very quickly. So it was pretty well, fun that to was, watch. That was my main goal of the race was, so the year before, uh, Mike McKnight, you remember, he, like, turned it around. And, we like, when I got into the last A station, they were like, oh, you know, Mike was, like, okay. flying. He was running, like, six-minute pace down that road into the finish. And I was like, six-minute pace? Like, I want to see how fast I could run it. And so that year, I, like, bombed down that road. And I checked my watch after. I was like, oh, man, I ran so fast. And I looked at my watch. It was, like, eight-minute pace. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. And so, so then, so this year my goal was, I was like, okay, like my one goal of the race, like I do want to, like, I want to hit seven minute pace on that because the eight minute pace was ridiculous and it felt like I was going so fast. So I'm like, my goal is to like run sevens down that. And I actually did manage to do that after <laughs> my nap. So yeah. I was uh, pretty stoked. <laughs> yeah. That is such an awesome way to finish, but I guess it, it helped to get the nap in, too. Yeah. No, if I had done it that night, I'm sure I would have been zombie zombie running down that, like I'm sure you were. Totally. Ready to and be you had And you had an interesting finish, too, with the uh, police car. A, uh, like an Arizona Ranger just like walked up to the finish line and was trying to order medical help and stuff like that. And I was like, I'm fine. I just finish a 250 like i'm just like we don't need an ambulance here or something uh, i'm just like surprised that the uh the race like the like our vipa didn't like inform him that everything was fine or you know like it's kokudona seems like it's gotten just such a big mm -hmm. um such it's such a big event now and like everyone kind of knows about it that I'm surprised. Uh, yeah, I think they did. Worried. I think they did try to tell him after he just wanted to have that power trip at the end or something. So it was a little oh, yeah, yeah, weird. Yeah. yeah. So we just left within like three minutes of finishing. Just get out of there. Don't need to argue with somebody about whether an ambulance needs to come. Just go to bed. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. you're signed up for next year, too. So are you, right? It's time. I know, but it won't be my... Well, yeah, I'll be in the Thousand Mile Club after next year, but I didn't want to go back. Like, I'd prefer not to, but, you know, I don't necessarily feel the need to, like... If I, like, DNF a race, I'm not someone who, like, feels the need to go back necessarily. Um, But I am, like... I'm always searching for that elusive, like, smooth race. Mm -hmm. And so, like, at Bigfoot, I finally had that last year where everything went, like, pretty much as smooth as I could hope for, right? And so I was, like, pretty happy with that. And so, like, Cocodona has just been such a disaster every single time I run it that I just, like, I just want a smooth race and just see see how everything could go if it just went smooth, <laughs> Yeah, and that's... I don't know if that's possible at a race like Okadona. Just the desert is just so brutal. I know that's my goal. Or like last year, it was like if I can just run a race that I feel good about, doesn't even matter how I place or anything, then I don't really feel pressure to go back. But I was injured within 50 miles of starting, so it was like, well, it's not going to be the perfect race. And when I just kept looking and seeing more and more people sign up for it, it was like, I need to just sign up for this for year number five. Which I know, year, and like... Yeah. Which year did you not do it? Uh, the the uh, altered year where they had okay. to start uh, with the fire. Uh, second year, I guess? Yeah, that would have been the second year. Yeah, and I heard that that, that course change was a little rough. Um. So I'm kind of glad I didn't do it that year, but I mean, it, yeah, it was just a totally different type a, of race. It's a good race. It's just not my kind of course. Um, so I, if I had a choice, I wouldn't go back cause I just don't like desert running. I mean, I love the, the end 
when you're running through Flagstaff. I mean, the trails near Flagstaff are great, but, mm-hmm. you know, the Bradshaws and, like, well, I mean, I guess I, I doubt there's a single person who's ever run that race that likes, uh, what is that field when you have to, oh, like, Fane Ranch. I don't think anyone yeah. has ever has any love for Fane Ranch. That's just the worst. It's just uh, like flags. You just, there's nothing, no trail. You just like follow flags, and if it's at night, you're hunting for through it. a cactus field. Yeah, like you can't you can't run it. Like it's flat. You could run it if it was not a field full of cactuses. You're trying not to kick, but yeah. Oh, last year both my pacers <sighs> kicked cactuses and had to like sit down and take their socks off and try to pull the cactus barbs out of their toes. Yeah, my pacer also kicked the cactus and had to get it out. And then I was like, yeah, he was convinced we could run it. And I was like, not convinced. And then I kicked the cactus and had to take my shoe off and get it out. And I was like, no more running. This is not runnable. No one runs this. It's it's impossible. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have much love for the the course itself because of the desert. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a great race, and Flagstaff is nice, but it's not the kind of race I, you know, once I once I get my nice race, I'm like done. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hopefully, I mean, it's got to be next year. It has to be next year. Yeah, let's get it done next year. I I know I love the idea of the race, but the actual like course crushes me every single time. Like on paper, it sounds pretty cool, everything, but it's hard. Uh, The last one I want to talk about is the newer race, Divide 200, up in Alberta, I guess. How is that race? Yeah, so it's Sinister Sports. So that's a – they're a great race company. They were definitely – you know, it was a first-year race last year. So there are a few things that went a little – off and then I it's the first race I've done so like I didn't typically have like crew or pacers at 200s like the first ones I did I didn't have anyone Mm -hmm. um for several years like a couple years and then um but the last few ones I have had crew and before that like I just had like know a lot of people and so like I'd randomly get friends to like help crew and pace me that I wasn't expecting And so I had help, and I, like, knew people. And so that was the first race in a long time I've done completely solo. So I had no crew, no pacers. I didn't know anyone there. And it was only about 100 runners. And so pretty small fields, especially at the front. It was really spread out. Um, the, The first part of the course is amazing. It's, like, one of the craziest things I've done during a, a race before. Like, you climb up to this ridge. And you just, there's not really a trail. Like, you just follow this ridge for, like, miles and miles. And, like, you bomb down, like, a scree field at one point. And, like, you can just look and see, like, the whole way you have to go. You're like, oh, I got to go over that other side of the ridge. And so it was, like, absolutely amazing. But I didn't read the course description quite closely enough (laughs) because there are a lot of dirt roads and, like, ATV connector trails. And so, like, I was expecting, you know, high mountain race, and it was like, oh, you actually need, like, a lot of speed if you want to do well at this race. And so, yeah, I think the guy that won it, like, he went somewhere close to 48 hours. Because if you have the leg speed, wow. you can run those flat sections really fast. And I just, coming off of Bigfoot, I didn't have the speed, and I wasn't expecting it, so it threw me off. But... Yeah, that that opening part of the course, the first like I don't know, 40k of it maybe is like oh. absolutely like insane. Um, and it's have... good you do that first. Yeah, do you have to talk in kilometers since it's a Canadian race when you say the first 40k? <laughs> well, like I I did the conversions at one point, but like I you know, written out I've it was mostly in kilometers because that's what they give you. But the problem I had at that race is because I was so solo, I I've never I haven't experienced this, and if I have, I don't remember having experienced this. But I got so lonely during that race. I completely gave up 
twice while running that race. Um, and so, cause I did the, fr I was with people the first bit and then I did about a hundred K section solo. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a single person. And then the third, the guy who ended up in third place, cause I guess I, I think I had been in third place. So the third place guy caught up to me and when he finally did, I just kind of looked at him. I was like, I haven't, I haven't seen anyone in like a day. Do you mind if I just like follow behind you for a while? And he was very nice. And let me just kind of like tag along behind him for a bit. And then I got into that last eight, eight station that's, I think is a, about mile 120. And I, I've been trying to catch up to him again, so I wasn't by myself. But then I did the last 80 miles without seeing a single other runner again. And I got, I was just so lonely in the last like 20 miles. I just completely gave up on that race. I like stopped running. I stopped eating. I like blew up on purpose because I didn't want to run anymore. I just wanted to like see other people. <laughs> I mean, I saw the volunteers, but like just hours and hours on the trail by yourself. And, uh, but once I got up, to the final ridge, I thought I heard someone behind me, and instead of, like, that making me happy, it, like, freaked me out, so I just bombed into the finish. And I wasn't sure if I was, like, hearing things or if there was actually someone behind me, so, but I, like, didn't want to chance it, so I just all of a sudden started eating and, like, running as hard as I could. <laughs> and uh, I get to the finish, and then, yeah, sure enough, like, two minutes, three minutes after me, a guy comes running in. Wow. And I guess his wife had called him on his cell phone to tell him he was, like, I was right in front of him. And I'd been, like, looking over my shoulder, too, because I wasn't sure if there was someone behind me. But I didn't see him. But he saw me. And then she told him that. And that's what gave him away. So if that hadn't happened, he definitely would have passed. But I didn't want to be passed in, like, the last five miles. I mean. No way. That would have been <laughs> pretty disappointing. So in all these remote races and stuff, do you have any good animal encounter stories of being out there? Oh, so actually right after right after I started running, when I heard him, the only encounter I had in all of Divide 200, I, there was like on the other side, like I was on the trail on one side of like a ravine. On the, directly across the ravine, there was like a moose. I was like, <laughs> oh. Nice. And like the first like, two days I hadn't seen anything. And then in the last like hour of a race, I see like a moose. So that's <laughs> yeah. nice. It must've felt like you're the only person on earth when you don't see anyone for so long. And then finally a moose uh, and then hearing yeah. a sound behind you must've been super startling. Yes, definitely was. Yeah. And then everyone always talks about like mountain lions. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a mountain lion at a race, but a lot of people I've been running with have seen mountain lions. Uh, at both Cocodona and Bigfoot, but like, <laughs> actually that first year Cocodona, it was hilarious. Um, so on the way into Whiskey Row, I think it was, I was running with another guy and we run past this guy and he's just crouched down like on, it's like a dirt road, like staring, just like sitting there and mm -hmm. we're like, hey, like you okay, dude? Like what's going on? You need anything? He's like, no, I'm good. He's like, I'm staring at a mountain lion. There's a mountain lion right there. I called Jamil on the phone to let him know. Like, I got, I've, I've notified all the race people, but there's a mountain lion out here. We're like, <laughs> yeah, there are. Like, maybe you shouldn't be sitting down. Like, maybe you should keep moving. I don't think Jamil's going to come out here to scare away this mountain lion because you think it's dangerous. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. really strange. <laughs> But I guess that's like really 200s. Bizarre. That's like how 200s are in general. People go so deep. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming the mountain lion was actually there, but it's like, probably shouldn't stare at it. And I'm pretty sure no one from the race is going to come out here just because you reported a mountain lion. Like, I think. And not quickly. Maybe you should come with them. <laughs> yeah. They're not coming out quickly either way. You shouldn't be sitting there for multiple hours. <laughs> No, it's like I'm staring at it. I can't let it out of my sight. I mean, maybe it was just a hallucination. It was probably just a hallucination. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's what I'll believe, but. Yeah. So what do you do for uh, work to afford to train and race all these 200s? Um, well, so, yeah, for um, 
the rate I know race fees are super expensive for most people and kind of like out of the it's a big concern um, I volunteer a lot for the race organizations to help um, you know you can get either reduced prices or free races even and so like that's one of the reasons I volunteer so much I volunteer every year at Moab and uh, mo usually the off years at Bigfoot like I said this year I'll be aid station captaining and I'm usually HQ at uh, Moab so that's an option sure certainly for people just because I know most people can't just drop I mean I couldn't afford to drop 1500 on yeah. multiple races a year um, and then like a race like divide they have prize money <laughs> yep. so my plan was to pay for it and then you know even if you get third place it just it pays for the race at least but I was like mm -hmm. oh if I can get first place then it definitely covers <laughs> the cost of traveling so you know I try to make it work um, because I know 200s are kind of outside of the realm for most most people and you know volunteering is such like a fun like I've met a lot of nice people, like awesome people running the races, but I've met so many awesome people volunteering as well, um, and people that will come out and volunteer multiple years or volunteer and then run it. And so, like, you really get to know the 200 community really well that way, and so I definitely recommend for people, if they have the time, um, if they can do some volunteering because it's, it's just so awesome. And, you know, the races always need – volunteers whether it's to run aid stations or for medical I know I know some of the races like our right by I think kind of um, hire out the medical and have it done by mm -hmm. they're not like directly in charge of the medical volunteers but like for that destination they are so yeah I remember you said with destination you could volunteer enough at one race to like pay for the next one and that's pretty cool how you just, yeah, you just almost yeah. trade off and you can pay for an entire race by being out there for a week in the woods. Yeah, that's, that's been my, uh, the way I've managed to figure it out. So yeah, like if, and if you're like an aid station captain, it's not quite as much time, but you just need to bring like a crew out with you. So if you have like people you can count on to come help you volunteer then you can run an a station for like two or three days and get your race credit that way so pretty Sweet. nice so what's but, what's next for you what do you have going on the rest of the year uh i have one race left toy de giants in uh italy so that's that's a 200 and, miler too right yeah it's like 20 it's 330k, so I think it's like 204, 205, but it's like 80 to 90,000 feet of vert climbing. <laughs> yep. So yeah. it's going to be I, – I attempted it once. It's one of my few uh, 200 DNFs. I have – well, I technically have – I have two 200 DNFs, uh, and one of them was at Tor, and it was just – it was not the right time for me to go out and try that race. Just I had a lot going on. And, um, but I made all the plans, so I couldn't, didn't feel like I could back out. And, um, it went about as well as I expected, and I DNF'd it my, like, 92, 94, somewhere around there. Dang. Um, so I'm hoping for a much better result this year. Yeah, redemption. Yeah, well, that'll be fun. And then just nothing the rest of the year, just like a really front loaded year all your races by August? You know, I don't, um, well, that, yeah, that's in September. Um, I, some people like are able to race a bunch of races in a year, but for me, I'm like three races is like max for me. And so like, with, especially with the 200s, like three 200s, like that's, I, I don't think I couldn't race much more than that. Like, cause <laughs> I do like to like actually race them. Right. And already with Cocodona and Tahoe, it's really hard with how close they are. And so, yeah, I don't really – and I'm not big on – some people like races as training. I'm not someone who's really able to do training races just because mm -hmm. I race every race, you know? So, like, 
I can't like take it easy as like a training run. Um, so yeah, so like next year, I I have like my next several years planned, unfortunately, as Whoa. one has to do these days. <laughs> uh, well, not several, like two years. Um, so I already know what I'm racing next year, and what is it? Uh, What's the insight? What are you racing next year? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna do Cocodona Tahoe, and then there's something in the works for Bigfoot. So it will be the 10 year anniversary of Bigfoot. So we're going to try and do something, something fun. Well, something cool. Okay. I guess we'll, I'll say. We'll be on the lookout. Well, Stay thanks tuned. for jumping on. <laughs> yes. Thanks for having me. So yeah, this was fun. fun. To with you. Yeah. You have the best stories. I remember for like 33 miles at the start of Coconona. All we did was tell stories and talk, and it was super fun. <laughs> and I was going to say, it's similar to when we were running together Cocodon, except we're both a little more coherent, I would say. Yeah, but even so, it was, like, cooler this year, so it was pretty coherent at that first 33 miles. Yeah, well, yeah, we were together on and off into... It was... I ran with you a bit out after Whiskey Row. Oh, that, what is that? That creek one I caught up to you? We were together for a little bit. I don't even yeah, know. I mean, off and on, we always were within a mile or two, I think, for <laughs> like, true. almost the entire race. <laughs> I know. I got into some eight stations. I'm like, how long ago did Jeff leave? Well, you would get in sometimes before me, but I would try to leave really quickly because that wasn't moving very fast and so then you'd catch up again and it felt like it kind of kept going like that yeah towards the end it was but i want to say i so i had a lot of stomach issues mm -hmm. which is really rare for me towards the like for mile yeah like 60 or 70 on for the rest of the race that's i ended up stealing a bunch of your stuff um, yep i know <laughs> allison was nice enough to donate a lot of your stuff but um yeah, so for like that 100 miles, I want to say for my like 100 to close to 200, you were like just ahead of me the whole time, I want to say. I like kept trying to like catch up to you and you were always like, oh, you left 15 minutes ago or whatever. And I was like, <laughs> cool. Well, I'll let you go. But thanks again. This was super fun. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having me on. And that's the episode for today. Thanks again, everyone. All your messages, likes, shares follows all that it's awesome as so we continue building more things adding more things i've done like a lot of maybe like 20 hours of trail work in the last week and a half and i am just exhausted but yeah i think next week i'll be going after the tahoe rim trail as well the fkt so we'll see how that goes but with that let's just call it a day see you guys later Stay elite, my friends.